resurrection. So last week we um, talked about the resurrection of Lazarus and just kind of whetting your appetite that Jesus has power and authority over death. Now I know in second service we never got to the message because you know the presence of God was so powerful. So if you missed last uh, Sunday's message we did in first service, it's on our YouTube page. Go back and watch that message on uh, Lazarus. Um, and if you're like, oh, a 30 minute message, put it on double time and watch it in 15 minutes. It's a really good uh, story. You need this in your life. How, much, how busy are you that you don't have 15 minutes to hear how Jesus raised the dead? Come on, somebody. So um, and t- today I want to talk about another um, dead raising uh, situation, and this is actually not where I was going. I felt strongly this week this is where we needed to go. Um, so uh, open your Bibles to Mark chapter 5. If you want to flip back a page or scroll, you know, left arrow to Mark chapter 4 and just kind of peek at what the Lord was doing, he was giving the people all of these parables, all of these stories to help build their faith and to encourage them in their walk with God. But the disciples found themselves in a storm in the boat coming back to Capernaum. Um, and uh, the, Jesus was asleep, and they woke him up, and they said, hey, boss, we're going to drown. And he said, no, we're not. You just need faith. And he calmed the wind and waves, and uh, the storm died down, and they got to Capernaum safely. And then in Mark chapter 5, at the beginning, uh, we won't have time for this story, um, uh, Jesus and the boys uh, went over to a, a place um, where they, they got off the boat, and immediately they were met by a homeless guy that was demon-possessed. And, uh, and I don't mean like one demon. The Bible says there was a legion of demons. Thousands of demons um, were in this guy, and he was completely out of his mind. So uh, Jesus did what Jesus does, and uh, he did a God thing for a man, and he cast out those devils into a herd of pigs, and the man was completely restored uh, you know, mentally, emotionally, physically, uh, back and, and, and was made whole. So, um, and then they're back in the boat, and they're heading back to Capernaum. Now, at the, all of this same time, uh, see, Capernaum was the headquarters for Jesus' ministry. And, um, but see, this was a new thing. You know, following Jesus as Messiah and believing that God had sent Messiah, this is all new. And it was freaking people out, especially religious people, those that were devout Jews. Now, in the town of Capernaum, there was a large synagogue. The synagogue would have always been like the center of the town. And the priest of that synagogue was a guy named Jairus. Now, Jairus, that we know of, was not yet a believer in Jesus. He was uh, religious. Um, It's probable because the Pharisees were the ruling party at that time in Israel that he was also a Pharisee, which they were super anti-Jesus. They were anti-Jesus because they thought that he was a nut job, that he was a trickster, he was a charlatan. And um, the problem is this. Jairus' daughter, who's 12 years old, was sick. Maybe she started out with a cold or a flu or a stomach thing and she just kept getting worse and worse and worse and wasn't getting better. And it's one thing when you're the rabbi and you go visit everybody else when their kids are sick, but who do you turn to when it's your kid that's sick? And he turned to the doctor and the doctor came and and, and he saw uh, his daughter and said, I'm sorry, um, uh, there's nothing I can do and it doesn't look good. She might not make it through this. And I remind you that Jairus is a powerful, wealthy, influential person in this town. And Jairus is like turning to everybody that he can turn to except Jesus. Because there's these stories that Jesus had cast out devils. There's stories that Jesus had healed the sick, even raised the dead. But Jairus is like, that's, that's, that's not for me. That's, that's for the, those losers. That's for the gullible. That's for the idiots. That's not for a, a person who's smart like me. But he's, funny how people do desperate things for their family that they love when their world is being rocked by tragedy. And Jairus isn't quite sure what to do because his baby girl could die at any moment. So he's wondering, what about that Jesus guy? There's always crowds that follow him. I wonder if I could get through the crowd and ask him to pray for my baby girl. Now, This would have been a huge mistake for his career because sometimes we put our career before our faith. And Jairus was thinking about his career. And had he done this, other priests would have asked for Jairus' resignation because you can't be a Jesus fanatic and a Jewish rabbi in Capernaum because the other Jewish priests were actually plotting to kill Jesus. So this, this was something that in his mind he's wrestling with. And he wasn't sure why the people were following Jesus by the thousands. Because the crowds that 
Jairus thought were just gullible people. These people thought that Jesus hung the moon, and he did. Mark chapter 5, verse 21. Jesus got into the boat again, and he went back to the other side of the lake. There was a large crowd gathered around him on the shore. Then a leader of a local synagogue whose name was Jairus arrived. When he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. Pleading fervently with him, he said, my little daughter is dying. Please come and lay your hands on her, heal her so she can live. Let me just stop right there because notice the faith of Jairus. A guy who probably wasn't a believer is now eating the dirt in front of Jesus' feet, in front of the whole crowd, and he says, if you will come lay your hands on my baby girl, she will live and not die. This unbeliever has more faith than most modern Christians in America today. Because most modern Christians today don't really believe that God can heal. But this rabbi, on his first five minutes of being a believer, says, I don't have time for political games. I don't have time for religious pride. I'm in a case of an emergency. My girl could die, and I need God to intervene. So I don't know what you've come here today for, but maybe you need to bring that thing that's in an emergency state to the Lord. Lord, I, my family is in an emergency state, and I, I, I need to lay myself down before you. My marriage, my finances, my health, my mind, my heart, I, I'm not playing no games. I didn't come to church to just do patty cake, to just do a religious exercise. I came to bow down before the King of Kings and Lord of Lords and say, you've got to heal this thing in my life. So Jairus knows what to do. He falls at Jesus' feet in front of his whole town and says, Lord, you've got to heal my baby girl. So keep reading, verse 24. Jesus is like, let's go. He went with Jairus to go to his house. All the people were following. This huge crowd of people is now following Jesus and Jairus heading to Jairus' house. Verse 25, they get interrupted. A woman in the crowd that had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding. By the way, notice that Jesus immediately was like, sure, let's go heal your daughter. See, there's something about faith that is super attractive to Jesus. That when we respond to the Lord in faith, he's like, let's go, I'm, I'm, I'm in it. But there was another person that, that was reaching out to Jesus in faith that day, and it was this woman that had been bleeding for 12 years. She also needed a miracle from Jesus. Verse 26 says, she suffered a great deal from many doctors. Over the years, she had spent everything she had to pay these guys, but they had gotten, she had gotten no better. In fact, she got worse. She had heard about Jesus, and she came up behind him through the crowd, and she touched his robe. She thought to herself, if I can just touch his robe, I will be healed. Immediately, the bleeding stopped, and she could feel in her body that she had been healed of this terrible condition. And Jesus realized at once that healing power had gone out from him, so he turned around to the crowd and said, hey, who touched me? The disciples look at the kind of irony, because I don't know if you've ever been to Israel with us. You know what's coming, right? One of these days, we'll be taking a tour of Israel and you're welcome to join us, and I will take you to some of these ancient streets. Speaking of which, Israel tour people. You know how I said maybe November? I got an email from my in-laws, Josie's parents that live in Israel. Maybe this summer is a news article they read. So, okay, one clap from somebody that wants to go to Israel. So, so stay tuned. We might be taking a trip to Israel this summer. We might not. Who knows? Um, the streets are very narrow. Like, you could just have, like, a, it's the width of a donkey is basically to get through a city street. Like, you could reach out and, and touch two homes. So the irony is they're in such a massive crowd of people just, like, crowding and touching Jesus. And then the Lord turns around and goes, wait, 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 who touched me? And the disciples are like, uh, who touched you? Because, you know, everybody touched you. And Jesus is like, no, somebody touched me. So he's looking around, and then this frightened woman raises her hand, trembling at the realization of what's happened. And she came, and she fell on her knees before Jesus. And she explained to him what had just happened. So he said to her in verse 34, Daughter, your faith, your faith has made you well. So go in peace, because your suffering is over. See, just like Jairus, this woman reached out to Jesus by faith. She touched Jesus by faith. See, here's the deal. 
There were hundreds, thousands of people touching Jesus, but only one was touching him by faith. I think every Sunday morning in American churches, there are hundreds, thousands of people that are around Jesus, but only a few reach out and touch him by faith. So my counsel to you is that when you have these opportunities, these moments when God is moving, you don't just stand there with your hands in your pockets thinking about lunch, thinking about the final four coming up this week. You, know, you think about his glory and his honor, his majesty and his power, and you reach out and you touch him by faith. This woman is healed. But you have to imagine Jairus is standing there like, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. I got to get you home to pray for my little girl. See, he had a timeline. And he's like, come on, God. I need you to do a man thing right now. I need you to do a God thing on a man's schedule. Let's go, let's go, let's go. And Jesus is like stopping and praying for this woman, this woman who had been bleeding for 12 years. Do you remember ancient Jewish law? And Jairus is a good rabbi. See, if she had a bleeding issue, she was ceremonially unclean, and she should not have been in the city that day. So for 12 years, this woman has been an outcast. But Jesus has mercy on her and says, I don't really care what the law says. Why don't we deal with what's going on in your heart? See, Jesus is no respecter of persons. In these same two chapters, he's ministering to a homeless guy that's demon-possessed. He's ministering to his own beloved disciples. He's ministering to the most influential and powerful person in the city, and now he's ministering to this woman who's an outcast for 12 years. Side note, how old was Jairus' daughter? I should do this for a living, right? See, 12 years before this moment, Jairus' daughter was born, and this woman contracted some sort of bleeding disorder, both so that 12 years later, Jesus could be glorified. Sometimes there's issues in your life that's just waiting for Jesus to be glorified in an area, in an issue in your life. It wasn't, it wasn't fame, it wasn't success, it wasn't money, it wasn't career, it wasn't a house. It was simply broken people that were turning to the Lord by faith and saying, God, you are the God of miracles. So Jesus took time for the woman with the issue of blood. But Jairus is standing there like, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Let me tell you something. Jesus' delay in meeting Jairus' need did not mean that he was denying Jairus the miracle that was about to come. So if you are waiting for God to move in an area of your life, it doesn't mean that God's not going to move. Have faith in the waiting. See, faith is the foundation that everything is built on. It's faith that, res that Jesus responded to Jairus' faith. It's faith that stopped Jesus dead in his tracks by this woman reaching out. Faith makes Jesus bigger than the problem you're facing. So that's why we live and we walk by faith. Not with what we can see with our natural eyes, but what can our hearts see that God can do in our life? So Jairus is like, okay, he healed that lady. I bet on the right horse. This, this guy might be the Messiah. Let's get you to my house and pray for my baby girl. And then he sees one of his friends coming from his house. Verse 35, while he was still speaking to her, messengers arrived from the home of Jairus, and they said, your daughter is dead. There's no use in troubling the teacher now. But Jesus overheard them. He said to Jairus, don't be afraid, just have faith. See, in this moment, in the waiting, Jairus is waiting while this woman gets her healing. And his friend comes, and there's just that look on his face and maybe through the crowd in the distance, he reads his lips and he says, she's gone. It was too late. Jairus had waited too long to turn to Jesus. All the regret, all the agony, all the tears, his heart probably went into his gut. He began to mourn immediately. But Jesus pats him on the back, winks at him. He's like, dude, it's okay. Just have faith. Did you notice that Jesus didn't panic? Listen, if Jesus doesn't panic in hopeless situations, we shouldn't either. But so often, I understand why the world is worried. I understand why unbelievers panic. I don't understand why children of the Most High God react 
in fear and in anxiety and worry. The moment you feel worry, you should recognize that you're responding in a way that is unbecoming of a child of the Most High God. Because this, yes, this was a hopeless situation, but the term hopeless means nothing to Jesus because to the Lord, nothing is hopeless when hope walks into the room. So he's like, dude, just have faith. Baby girl's gonna be okay. I've got a little bit more to write of this story. So let's, let's keep walking to your house. See, faith will be rewarded when all hope seems lost. Jairus got word that his daughter had died, but Jesus never stopped moving in Jairus' direction. See, when God is moving in your life, he's not put off by bad news. Well, I got laid off in the middle of this thing. Okay. Well, I got this bad report from the doctor. Okay. Well, we spent our stimmy money, and now I got more month than money. Okay. Jesus is like, I'm not worried. Mark chapter 5, verse 37. Jesus stopped the crowd outside of Jairus' house. He wouldn't let anybody else go with him except for Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw how much commotion and weeping and wailing there was. Now, I remind you from last week's lesson, this was normal in Jewish culture. When somebody died, they would have to put the body in the dirt immediately. There was no refrigeration. It's a hot desert climate. So the moment somebody died, young men would begin digging a hole. But that meant that there would be this intense screaming, wailing, and mourning. So this is a fairly normal, but albeit gut-wrenching situation to walk into. Verse 39, Jesus went inside and he said, what's all the commotion and weeping? The child's not dead, she's only asleep. The crowd laughed at him. Jesus made them leave. He took the girl's father and mother and the three disciples into the room where the girl was lying. See, I, I, people in the Middle East mourn loudly. Still to this day, you'll see it on the news from time to time. There was this screaming and mourning. So Jesus didn't want to have that around, so he made all those people leave. But isn't it interesting who he brought with him? Peter, James, and John. See, he had 12 disciples at this time, but he only brought three. I propose to you that it's possible that even though they were seeing miracles, that only these three had enough faith that Jesus could raise the dead. So where is your level of faith in Jesus? Are you one of the nine or the three that you really believe that Jesus has power over death. And I also point out to you that it was the crowd at Jairus' house that mocked Jesus. If you're gonna put your faith in Jesus as a miracle worker, be prepared for the world to mock you. If you're gonna put your faith in Jesus as a miracle worker, be prepared for the church to mock you. You're gonna have to be willing to look like a fool in the eyes of the world to be full of faith in the eyes of God. Because even in the church today, we have Christians and leaders that don't believe that God has the power over legions of demons, that God has the power over chronic sickness, or that God has the power over death. But I told you last week that at the end of a prize fight, at the end of a UFC fight, the one who's dancing around with their arms in the air is the champion. And Jesus has been the champion dancing around for 2,000 years because he has defeated sickness, he has defeated demons, and he has defeated death. And I remind you that the same spirit that raised Lazarus from the dead and the same spirit that cast the demons out of that man and the same spirit that calmed that storm and the same spirit that healed that woman and the same spirit that's about to bring this girl back to life lives on the inside of you. Verse 41, holding her hand, Jesus said, Salitha Koum, which means, baby girl, it's time to get up. The little girl was 12 years old. She immediately stood up and walked around. They were overwhelmed and totally amazed. Jesus gave them strict orders not to tell anybody what had happened. And then he said, give this girl something to eat. Imagine the mixed emotions of Jairus walking into the bedroom where his daughter's body was laying. You see your beloved, lifeless. Jesus walks into the room with you, takes her by the hand. And I don't know exactly, I thought it was so interesting that they called out in the Bible the Aramaic phrase that Jesus said. 
Very rarely does that happen. I have to imagine that that is the exact same phrase that Jairus used to wake up his daughter when she was late for school. Baby girl, it's time to get up. And that day Jesus says, baby girl, it's time to wake up. And she comes back to, imagine the joy and the tears of pain that are now wiped away with worship and adoration of Jesus. And Jesus picks up that baby girl and says, mama, she's gonna need an eight count nuggie with some chicken nug- with some uh, Chick-fil-A sauce. And then Jesus just disappears. Think about the three disciples that were in the room. I remind you that John later says that there were actually many more miracles that Jesus performed, but these were the only ones to make the four stories. Meaning that if this was in the Bible, it's there for a reason. It's there to build your faith. It's there to build our faith. Yes, faith that Jesus has power over wind and waves. Jesus has power over demons. Jesus has power over chronic sickness. Jesus has power over death. And when we read these stories, both in the Bible and still today, and what God is doing in our church, it's building a trophy case in your high school of that time that your team won state 20 years ago. And it reminds you that if it could be done then, it could still be done today. It's a trophy case of the miracles of God, of the power of Jesus. Of his, it's not a, tr- a monument to our goodness. Like, well, I'd love for God to move in my life. I'd love for God to set me free from this addiction. I'd love to God to fix my marriage. I'd love God to help me financially. I'd love God to help with this torment in my life. It's not about your goodness. It's about his victory and our faith in him. It reminds us that nothing is impossible for God. Nothing is impossible for God. Last Sunday in our service, a member of our church had been dealing with with years of debilitating debilitating hip and leg pain, was healed and went for a run this week. Last week, a member of our church that had been hungry for more of God and wanted the baptism of the Holy Spirit was filled with the Holy Ghost and began to pray in other tongues last Sunday. Last Monday, I could not stop praying in the Spirit all day long. And I know it's like, well, that's what you do for a living. Listen, I love to pray. I love to pray in other tongues. I love to let my spirit man pray. But as much as I love Jesus and as super spiritual as I am, a good prayer time for me is 15 to 20 minutes. But on Monday, I just, it didn't matter what I was doing. All day, I could not stop praying. I, I mailed it in for dinner that night and was just grilling up some hot dogs. I mean, they were Hebrew nationals, so they were kosher, so it was spiritual. It's a true story. But I'm just ripping in tongues, just cooking hot dogs. My, I'm just stirred up, and I assume it has to do with what God did Sunday. 10.30, we're getting ready for bed. Phone rings. It's one of y'all. Pastor, I'm coming to your house, and I'm bringing my brother, who's been a prodigal running from God for a long time. I want you to pray for him. He's gonna get right with God tonight. And these two young men came to my house and got right with God late Monday night. Give him praise. (laughs) His name is actually one of those cards buried in there from when we prayed for lost people back in October. We have to find it and pull it out. Because he's totally, I texted him yesterday. I said, do you still love Jesus or are you back to just liking him? He said, pastor, I love Jesus so much. Yeah, come on, somebody. Paul told the church in Corinth, he said, we have to understand these kingdom things because we have the mind of Christ. So we need to put on the mind of Christ. Put on Christ's mind when you face trial. Put on Christ's mind when you face sickness. Put on Christ's mind because he ain't afraid of demons. He ain't afraid of sickness. He ain't even afraid of death. Put on Christ's mind mind. I'm telling you, all it takes is a a sliver. Jairus wasn't even yet a believer. All he had was a sliver of faith. You might even say a mustard seed of faith. And God raised his little girl from the dead. See, your little tiny bit of faith doesn't disqualify you from God doing a miracle in your life. The devil will lie to you 
and say, listen, your addiction to pornography, you're vaping, you're weed smoking, you're getting drunk, you're getting anger, your fear, your anxiety, your loneliness, your depression, that disqualifies you from God moving in your life. And God's like, no, it doesn't. I just need a mustard, it's just a sliver of faith. See, faith is attractive to God. Up, up on your feet, let's pray. In that time of worship earlier, I read to you that portion of scripture from Revelation chapter three. The only thing offensive to God isn't unbelievers. It's lukewarm Christians. Unbelievers don't offend Jesus. Lukewarm Christians do. Makes them sick. One of the translations of that Greek word spit is vomit. So that when John recorded that, he recorded it as Jesus said, I wish you were hot or cold, but because this church is lukewarm, I'm gonna vomit you out of my mouth. The days of limp-wristed, mamby-pamby, kumbaya Christianity are over. I'm calling you to live white, hot, passionate, fervent lives for Jesus. That you respond to him in faith that you do what this woman with the issue of blood did, that you do what Jairus did, and you forsake everything else, and you bow at the feet of Jesus. See, when, when Jairus made that decision to seek out Jesus, he was saying, I don't care about my career, I don't care about my friends, I don't care about my colleagues, I just need Jesus to touch my little girl. I wish Christians had as much devotion to the Lord as this unbelieving rabbi had. Father in heaven, I thank you that you are the God who performs miracles. I thank you that you are the champion of our faith. I thank you that you love us so much that it's not our good works, it's not our big faith or even our little faith, but it's that we have any faith in you that is attractive. Lord, I thank you that you finished that chapter from Revelation saying that you're knocking on the door of our heart and that if we would open the door of our heart, you would come in. Lord, I've got people here this morning and some watching online that are lukewarm, some that are cold, some that are prodigals that have run from you, and today is their day of salvation. Lord, I pray that they would respond to you now in this moment with faith and surrender their lives to you. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're here this morning and there's sin in your life, if you've been lukewarm, if you've been walking away from God, if you've never known the Lord, today is your day to get right with God. Repent of your sin, ask him to forgive you, and surrender your life to him. If that's you, I wanna pray for you, but I'd like to know who I'm praying for. So whether it's your first time or your first time in a long time, would you shoot your hand up real high and just say, preacher, pray for me. I see your hand and I see your hand. Is there anybody else? Shoot your hand up real high. I see your hand, I see your hand, I see your hand, I see your hand, I see your hand. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Give him praise, give him praise. <laughs> Jesus! <laughs> Hold on. What up, online people? There's a whole lot of folk in that today is their day of salvation. What about you? I don't want to forget about you. Your heart's beating out of your chest right now. Tears streaming down your face. It's because God loves you. He's crazy about you. And he wants you to join these here this morning in in surrendering your life to Jesus. So if you believe it in your heart, I'm gonna lead you in a prayer. We'll all pray this together to help you and support you. Say, dear Jesus, please forgive me of my sin. I surrender my life to you. I repent of my sin. Wash me and cleanse me of all unrighteousness. Make me holy like you are holy. Forgive me, Lord, for being lukewarm. By faith, I surrender to you to be the Lord of my life. And I receive the gift of eternal life and of your great love for me. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen, and amen, and amen. Come on, come on, come on. Thank you, Jesus.
So if you're at home and watching online, what I want you to do is text the name Jesus to 817-405-2244. That's gonna give you an auto response form. Please fill that form out. Let us know what God has done in your life today. If you're here this morning, reach into the seat back in front of you and fill out that connect card. Let us know what God's done in your heart so we can celebrate with you and encourage you. A lot of you might need to get baptized in water. Sign up on your connect card, either online or in person and say, I need to get baptized in water man, I was backslidden, I was lukewarm, and I'm putting that lukewarm Christian dead in the water, and this white, hot, fiery, in love with Jesus is coming out of the water. 